Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Joseph Felix, Felix Gerardus Eusen will defend the academic thesis, ESD-based education fulfilling the transformative promise of education for sustainable development. May I invite you to present a summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis. You've got 50 minutes to do so. Please Thank go ahead. Thank you. Dear Pro Chair, my promoters, members of your position. Ladies and gentlemen, I bid you welcome. Thank you for bearing with me today with a special welcome to those who invited me to the trenches of practice. I propose to base future education on sustainable development, not add it to it, but entrust young people to create a future we all envision. Obviously, many are aware and UNESCO made it clear to us that education is essential and crucial to bring near a more sustainable future. People should be empowered, gain understanding and raise to action. However, critically observing the process of 20 years by now, I found little effectuation yet, no transition strategy available. At the meantime, squandering the fields of practice, going in and out schools as a tradition element so crucial, I found them under pressure, criticized, demanded off to do ever more, STEM languages, citizenship, student center learning, etc., etc., while we as society were trampling on them, criticizing them, and then put ESD on that stack, put even more pressure on them. In parallel, studying the system, I found the system tends to bend a perceived linear learning line. Perhaps, if I may say so, even corrupted, overpressured, a system partly not aware of itself anymore, scrunched by stones and additions elements that made it hardly to stare. Then filled with new initiatives, idea, preachers of change, all had to go for the better. And yesterday wasn't good enough anymore. Then position ESD in that field? No, I thought we can do better. And the only option I had in those days was look young people straight in the eye, look towards the future I imagined as logical. Seeing those kids no longer as new parts of the machinery we assemble, the unsustainable present, but to have them study on those teams that define our future straight through the system, therefore reorient the learning. So I hypothesized that education for sustainable development, development is actually a matter of ongoing continuous learning processes, learning processes on future defining themes connected within the region, people to people together with people on behalf of this earth. Obviously, that provided a range of research questions. Today, I can only highlight four. I will observe how acceptable was this proposition hypothesis. Can it be realized? What about pupils and students? Can they handle this learning and vision? And what about teachers? Can they organize it? Can they guide these students? And if not, can we enhance teachers' capacity to do better? So what is required? Further, I can only touch on briefly and hopefully in the course of the questions raised by the opposition. I took an holistic approach, actually taking all together that might be important. So not only observing sustainability and the priorities in education, but also their present day challenges, have an eye for reality and the struggles, and then invite society, industry, governmental institutions, provinces and the like, and positioned ESD as a converging factor to bring us together not as an addition. All these factors and actors, important, those stakeholders, those people with knowledge and influence and experience, I invited at the table. It was a many year process that created eventually a multidisciplinary cooperation. We inquired, we sought, we debate, we had headaches, we fought, we discussed. And in all of that, we think, and it, I underline the we, we created Agora. We made mistakes, but we tried in practice. We didn't hide in academics. We studied and researched, reflected, looked back, looked forward, were critical to ourselves and came to, to many conclusions. I can only share a few with you today. First of all, we have to get rid of the illusion of 
people planet profit. Isn't that silly that people does that planet never had a voice? Shouldn't we not realize that people and the economy, society is actually the same? We are industry. We are devouring this world. It's not somebody else out there. It's us. And then what about not human life? So we end up in a hustle of people talking to people about what other people should do or refrain from. We should do no better. Therefore, I proposed a new way of looking. Let us first learn about this life granting earth, about capacity, about animals, about food, about the, the ecology we already have, this God given presence. So invite youngsters to learn about this earth, about well being. We are still capable and convinced to create always enough for everybody. But earth first, then people and not human life. And only then consider if there is overshoot to waste or if we should not dramatically change our behavior. Of course, I proposed implicitly disciplines and subjects would be scattered in the future. Lesson plans and books now available would not suffice anymore for the students learning would be different. Yet this multidisciplinary alliance founded, found a joint understanding. It was me researching and above all learning what industry thought and scientists consider, what governments considered, how youth care and welfare, product production, consumption came together. So we said, okay, this focus on youth is essential, we agree. We should create these ongoing learning pathways. It is essential to free schools from this, let me say, idiotic burden, this pressure. And we believe the dimension would function. So it was an appreciative inquiry, for sure, but one guided by rudimentary ideas I proposed. And one basic element, obviously, underlying the whole is we should create open education areas where young people could, be, could move around safely again, together with old people and with youngers and experience and feel and touch, as the English say, literally grasp their understanding and yet hold it in their hands. So therewith we created Agora. And the first research question can be answered partially already. For would it be acceptable? Obviously, those that would have to accept it were those sitting on the table and creating. We created three rudimentary instruments for word is not enough. One should observe and practice. One should, one should be open to failure, to learn, to see. Through flight for knowledge, we investigated is it possible that young people can collect, can jointly create these teams? And what if they come back from the region? How would they behave? What would their experience tell us? And would they be able to reach out to the rest of the world? And already understanding this would be a magnificent challenge to teachers. All in all, these instruments are, of course, embedded and overlapping. But they all share the notion of active learning, inquiry-based learning, problem-based learning, make it relevant. So I'm at the right university here for these uh, principles, I think, and make it community-based again. Briefly looking at these instruments, picture the flight for knowledge, the collection as a mind map, but one unfolding through a youngster's life. One, a young woman can take under the arms and carry with her to be filled with more experiences and more knowledge, individually owned, jointly constructed, filled in a multi-channel perspective. So we took that to practice, put practice where our thinking and our mouth was, and we found it works. This can be done. It suits youngsters. So if you allow me, I will take two and uh, question two and three together now, stating that students can interact, they can debate, they can question, they go beyond the curriculum, they have a high speed of interaction, they associate, they drive teachers wild. And there is, of course, a challenge for the teachers. How wild can this get? When they came back after first experiences, they told me, Joss, I'm getting berserk with positive energy. But what do I have to do? How do I associate? How do I combine? How do I understand? It became even more explicit through business class. When kids went outside, they came back to their high school. They were full of ideas. They were invigorated. They started to create. They even brought in values and said, this machinery is not OK. That product we make, a question. But they could question others. They proved capable even of creating business cases. We didn't need to put values on their heads. They inquired about our values and what we were doing to the world. So also in business class, we saw, if I may put that together, the discovery of unexplored capacity. They are capable of so much more than we conceive presently. 
they gave rise to prior knowledge, knowledge for example, told us what they knew already or thought to know. This was obviously very strange to teachers and to many researchers standing by my side and observing this practice, analyzing what we were doing. But also teachers for enjoying and understanding under the passion. Then obviously, very briefly, it was a festival. It was joyful to see young people reach out to others, to not learn about other cultures, but to learn with people and together. And modern day technology, of course, makes that easy. So yes, it's an open door. They learned to apply languages, to understand culture, to question each other. And if I wrap that up in one of the boys remarks, he said, they are really out there. And that made me silent. I think, yes, yes, it's not what we have thought the world is made of. The world is there for them. So they understood. And of course, the teachers questioned and said, how do I do this? There's a new symphony with new instruments, with new players. I said, yes, and to make it even more challenging, the symphony is written by students. So there is no box, yes. See, no, it is not a matter of thinking outside the box. Forget about the box. You have the knowledge. And I was extremely lucky and grateful and thankful while researching to sit next to these practitioners, next to these fantastic people that took the challenge, that opened up, that were fair, that accepted critics, more than the researchers, more than the field of academics. So through teaching, I learned myself. And of course, the associative capacity is a challenge. And teachers don't go out in industry every day. And perhaps they even don't know what is unfolding around their school. I'm not negative about that. I'm positive that there is sufficient capacity within the teacher population. But one critiquer, one thing we found researching also many, many teacher training institutes, there is the light. There is the base where we should change. There's the button to turn. We need more open worldwide citizen, youngsters today teaching the next generation. So teachers, yes, a festival, fantastic people. And we as society made it that those teachers became soldiers of schooling instead of masters of education. And then in between the working and the researching and the evaluating, suddenly schools started to change. Or perhaps they didn't change because of the process and the research. No, because they just rediscovered what they already knew. We made it explicit. We gave new hope and new, new confidence. There is a lot in it already. So then finally answering research question one, yes, indeed, it was acceptable. Because an unplanned and unforeseen development started, the change to transition started without guidance and very ill managed by me because I was flying around between policy and practice and fields and discussing and seeking understanding. I asked those schools forgiveness for this. If you allow me to share a few, to share a few more findings if some minutes remain. As I indicated earlier, the field is full of new ideas and fantasy and preaches of change. It is not necessary. Much of the knowledge we need for learning psychology education the raising kids is already there. We don't need new fantasies. And many teachers already know what to do. So let's get this in a flow. There is a continuous process of learning. And let us not seek our hope in a whole school approach. No more contracts, commissions, no more agreements and meetings. I beg UNESCO focus on the students, not on the structures, not on superficial research idiotic political ideas. This world is of the young, they're out there. They've shown us and we are convinced they can do this. We have to re-empower, trust them, bring them there. And of course, not you cannot go to every organization or every production plant. We need first-hand entrepreneurs in primary business. No blah, blah about greening an industry. And forgive me if I say so about greening the compass. You can, you can, Take this education to an old factory and it will work. On the positive side, if you look to industry, I see the potential to fold HRM and education together in what I call for now ESD based CSR. Then in the final sheet, was it all so fantastic and easy? No, absolutely not. There is a lot of frustration. There are a lot of eyes in this society. There is ego. There is 
cross-funding, subsidies. Society is a patch blanket. It's not a cohesive whole, warming, welcoming the young. We should be open to that. Even most colorful patches like technology promotion and environmental education, they went for their own goals. This sounds negative, but we unfortunately found there are also patches that appeared holes that weren't even present. So the fabric we created, we should observe and take a very critical view on. And I hope that my research and our findings can one day contribute to these many eyes and egos to become one again on behalf of the continuous development of our next generation. For they are capable of constructing the sustainable world we are just talking about at the moment. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much for your attention. I never did my job right also. The clock is pointing at the right time. Thank you very much for hearing me. Thank you for your presentation. The uh, opposition will be opened by Professor Dr. Roy van der Brink Buchten, whose chair is in critical thinking and who was a member of the assessment committee. The floor goes to Professor van der Brink Buchten uh, through uh, the online uh, channel. Right. Thank you. Um, I've got uh, two big questions. And interestingly, in, answer, in asking the first, I was taken by something that you said, which was how students rediscover what they already know, which is very much a Socratic position that education nearly allows this to come out. And that fits with my first big question, which is you, that you make the claim on many occasions that students will think critically which clearly pleases me. Um, although on another occasion, you say students are held back by not being able to think critically. And I suppose my central point is, how do they become these competent critical thinkers? Um, in that the research evidence suggests that the most effective way of them becoming critical thinkers is to teach them to be so rather than it just emerging, um, that it's a, an innate skill. So yes, I was um, interested in how this um, framework, this method will get students to think critically. Thank you very much for this question, esteemed opponent. It's, I think, from the bottom of my heart. Um, let me try to answer in one phrase. We see critical thinking arise within youngsters if we are fair to them and open. Yesterday, I questioned 50 students in Venlo if they ever heard about Fridays for Future. 48 of them said, no, I praised them for that acknowledgement. I challenged them to reconsider the rules of Black Lives Matter. I challenged them that they consume jeans, that they walk the streets on Friday afternoon and drink an expensive coffee in the evening, go to the Burger King, put the waste on the street, then buy a T-shirt made in Bangladesh because they cannot afford anymore a decent T-shirt because the sustainable coffee has been too expensive. Then they fall silent, look at me and said, wow, so what can we do? It is there where I see the emerge of thinking to begin with. Then one should be open and associative to, to, to be vulnerable as adults, yeah. as educators, yeah. and be, be prepared to say, I don't know. Yeah. I do not understand. We created this world and only vaguely try to steer it, but we don't understand. It is then that youngsters convene amongst each other and debate. And in this debate, other opponent. In this debate is the critics. There is the rise. There is the new sense making of a young generation. So go back to my one phrase answer. Be fair, honest, open. Tell them we don't know everything anymore and we need their support. We shouldn't lecture them. We should invite them. But we might need to teach them to be critical thinkers. <laughs> Okay. Um, can I have my second question now, or um, is this within my... Uh, the second question, I suppose, it, it, it's almost a sort of uh, um, linked with the first, because on many occasions you say that um, education for sustainable development covers 
all the curriculum? And uh, you say, put learning for sustainable development at the base of education. So it becomes this all encompassing framework. And naively, I thought, where do I learn about um, Shakespeare's King Lear in this then? If I'm off um, going to uh, factories and I'm off looking at uh, sewage, I'm sorry, I'm not being flippant, sewage works and all the rest of it. Where, where am I going to learn um, medieval history? Where am I going to learn, um, um, well, yes, literature, music? Where is that fitting into this framework? Yeah, I can. Uh, yeah, it is a coincidence, a wonderful coincidence. I used, I, I put the, uh, Shakespeare on stage also yesterday, not King Lear, <laughs> but uh, presenting a, a Hamlet soliloquy where he questions himself why he's not capable of action while knowing who murdered his father. I inquired with the students why we don't end the war in Jemen, why we accept tension. I said, how can it be that we know but do not act? I said a great philosopher, psychologist, a great thinker already questioned this behavior, this human incompetence long, long ago. He wrote a poet about it. He wrote a play about it. So Shakespeare, in this case, is somebody addressing us, challenging us to reconsider our behavior. In this simple example, poetry is a messaging and mind opener, but the arts can also be a paint. That it can be the creation. When, when youngsters come back from industry, they say these shoes can be redesigned. The redesign is art. They change color. They refurbish a home for the elderly because they didn't like the white walls. Is this not an expression of art? Are these not the moments we can invite an artist to tell about the effects of color and how good living can be? So the application of art Oh, there's a, transmiss a transmission option for ideas and philosophy. And I can go on like this for hours. I'm sure you believe it. So art, creation, expression is a way of communicating with each other. We cannot do without art. We cannot do without culture. So it's so deep in our veins, it is almost unproductive to say, okay, Friday afternoon at three o'clock, we will teach you art. So in my vision, don't teach art. Let them live it and make it like the little girl I just showed in the picture. Okay. Thank you. I think I've probably used up my time. Um, but uh, I, I have many more questions, but I'm not, I haven't got any more time. So thank you very much. Read upon that each of you will get roughly around eight to nine minutes uh, for a short discussion, and we know we're all time compressed. So the opposition now goes to Professor Dr. Jan Rotmans, who was also a member of the assessment uh, committee. And um, the chair of uh, Professor Rotmans is on uh, um, transitions and transition management uh, at Erasmus University, Rotterdam. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dear candidate. I read your dissertation with great pleasure and a bit of annoyance. Come back to both of it. Um, the pleasure is, I think, if you try to implement sustainable development in a kind of rigid system like education, I think that deserves applause. In that sense, you are kind of a hero. It's a heroic attempt to do that. I know that from my own experience how difficult it is. So I really, really appreciate that. On the other hand, your dissertation is not so much an academic book. It's more a fascinating journey, what you have experienced throughout your uh, traveling through the education system. Um, but I'm not going to give you only compliments here. That would be rather boring. So. My question is, are you also an academic hero? For me, the problem lies in the way you treat sustainable development and uncertainties and transitions. Let me explain that. You have chosen for an ecocentric approach. That means that welfare and well-being are a part of ecology. That is a choice. 
That's your choice. That's not an objective choice. It's your choice throughout your whole implementation of, let's say, uh, OPEDUCA and ESD, you are taking that. Well, I've also run uh, a big European project, Matisse, and uh, Professor Paul Weaver was part of that. And we concluded after five years of research that sustainable development is intrinsically, it is subjective, it is ambiguous, it is complex and normative. So there's no way you can objectively define what it is and objectively apply that to very uh, various uh, kind of regions. So here comes my point. Why do you use sustainable development as an objective notion? Because that's non-scientific. You are imposing your choices upon pupils and different regions. It's not only naive, but it's also scientifically um, not legitimate. So can you please explain to me why you have done that? Secondly, the way you use uh, uncertainty is also a bit awkward. You, you seem to see it as a kind of a problem. Well, I see it as a kind of an opportunity. What we can learn from the corona crisis is that we should let pupils and students make more mistakes as, as much as possible, learn from that and trying to develop themselves, focusing on blind spots and black swans, uh, let's say as denoted by, by persons like Taleb. So we must learn them to deal with uncertainties. And thirdly, about the way you, you use transitions, if you wanna scale up your concept, you need knowledge from the transition literature. So why haven't you used that practice, but you also not refer to it? Okay. Highly esteemed opponent, uh, thank you very much. That is uh, a lot to uh, to reflect on. That's first the normative, uh, stepping, uh, taking, taking off from ecology. Um, I think our considerations and experiences can go hand in hand because perhaps I was not clear, uh, we avoid the normative as much as possible. The message we convened is that the normative is to be developed by the next generation. I am not the one advising to put solar cells on a school's roof. I require with, uh, students if they can learn from that. I am not promoting animal life even. So we stayed away as far as possible from any normative approach because we truly believe that the value generation is more important. So you, that's why I wrote, we cannot stick our values on sustainable. I, I understand that, but then you are turning your back to the real world. I give you an example. The European Commission has come up with a list of energy technologies which are sustainable or unsustainable. Surprisingly enough, on that list is nuclear energy and natural gas. That used to be different than 20 years ago. How do you deal with that? We should deal with that, for example, by watching yesterday's uh, documentary on the taking care of, of waste, uh, nuclear waste. The essence is that not I understand the choice. The essence is that those studying now and living in that foreseeable future understand the choices we make. So I'm not steering them away from nuclear energy. My private opinion here is irrelevant, I believe. What I hope is that they develop enough knowledge and understanding about the consequences, about their choices. Because, and I admit implicitly, I dare would state that our form of decision-making was partly default. But don't you also, um, let's say, well, let me phrase it differently. The students need to learn and understand why the political arena make these choices. That's part of the education process, isn't it? Now, exactly, exactly, uh, dear opponent. That's hitting the nail on the head because observing how much young students, primary, secondary education, let alone further education, right, the MBOs, how often are they challenged to form a political opinion? Seldom or never. I would hope that the political argumentation, the understanding of what we do now eh, as elderly, eh, I would hope that we give them access 
to that forum of debate. So my concern is they are now distanced from that through the books and the lesson scale, schedule, through their orientation on examinations. Political science is not at the end at the ROCs. I wish there was because 60% of the voters filling up our parliament is out there on the streets. Okay. I hear what you say. Still, we disagree. Why don't you use the word impact? Because uh, in the last couple of years that uh, came up as a kind of an alternative. Uh, you either create positive impact on the environment, on people, on the economy, or negative. As simple as that. My children are using that. I take that advice to heart. It's indeed a term I didn't write down. So it is in my argumentation. It is about doing the right thing together. And then about the uncertainty. It, can you explain that a bit? Of it? Why do you see it as a problem and not as an opportunity? Um, very uh, blankly put, uh, I think the mind has to reach a, a, a certain moments of peace, of reflection, of consideration. If we go to young people and say, oh, the future is doomed. There will not be air to breathe. We don't know what to do about the energy. Everything is so uncertain. Everything is shaky and then dark around us. That's not a base to work from. But that's not what I mean. I mean, how can we prepare them for COVID-25? By making them understand how connected we are worldwide. When they exchange with each other, we saw processes of youngsters in Germany discussing with youngsters in Canada the, the thawing of the permafrost. They talked about animal life and how this will evolve. Then we take a step back. And only when they question and seek knowledge, data and information, we seek to provide it for them. So it, my proposition is not to hand them a possible solution, but wait as long as possible for them to de discover the solution. So that uncertainty then is a positive element. Yesterday I asked who won the Second World War, a very tricky question. So Europe was in chaos, but who won? And who is the strongest country in Europe today? That made them ponder. From chaos, we created something new. And we're very much in line there. Thank you. The uh, opposition will be continued by Professor Dr. Paul Riva, whose chair is on um, economic geography and sustainable science. He also was a member of the assessment committee. The floor goes to Professor Riva. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, well, first of all, thank you for the uh, presentation. Uh, I enjoyed the presentation. And uh, I, I guess my, uh, my interest really is, is that uh, you, you are proposing uh, an approach to edu education for sustainable development. Uh, but there, there is already uh, a mainstreamed uh, approach, which is based upon uh, a competences framework. Um, and I wonder if you could comment critically um, on that framework and say something about how you see the relationship between it and your approach. The, the, the sound just, just fell a bit on me. I, I, I didn't catch the framework you referred to in the, the, the last part of the question. Uh, the, the, the competences competencies framework, which is uh, often used in, in, in university teaching of sustainable development. I got it. Um, the competencies framework, the reason I, I criticize it, and I admit rather bluntly uh, every now and then, is that I believe of that we, but that we saw, that we observed that uh, uh, creating lists of competences that don't shock the learner, that are derived of impact have little effect. So when, if we go up to young students, you know, university level and primary schools, and say, you got to work together. They say, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, 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 you need to express yourselves. You, you, they say, yeah, yeah it, will, it will be OK. So the problem is not the, the, the competence framework, distinguished professor. It, the, 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 the problem we raise is that, that listing these kinds of open doors, if I may say so, will not lead us to transition, will not bring us further. And if we refer to 21st century skills, they've been around for years, open doors, no reaction, no movement, indeed no impact. So there is the, the, the bottom line of my criticism. I rather shake these youngsters with 
values and competences I just summed up. So yesterday I said a great competence of humankind is to keep its mass in control by killing each other. What do you think, young brains? We are competent of killing each other, a unique species. Can I have your opinion? And then we can learn, honorable oh, professor, what they start thinking. And then I can write down the competences I observe at that moment. Okay, so um, if, if your concern is that we have been using a competences framework for a very long time now, and we don't see a level of action towards sustainability uh, in practical terms that you would like, uh, what makes you think that your approach will lead to uh, more effective action? What we consider, and I do not fully claim, but what I propose is that the discovery of value and competences by learners themselves is per definition more effective than briefing them and sending them the list by email on what their competences should be in our perspective. So I think the sheer discovery of students of next generation, their discovery of reality, bumping their heads, falling to their knees, making mistakes, that would be the route to develop. For them, they will transfer competences to themselves. They will address each other. Because if we, and please also allow me to observe that the competence listing is used too long in the sustainability uh, discourse. It, of course, it was of great use to, to make these first insights and to produce them, to communicate them. But it was done so almost 20 years ago. And still today, I'm invited for conferences where they say, let's discuss ESD competences. I say, no, I'm not coming. I would like to discuss learning and education and progress and cooperation with industry and sustainable consumption and, and, and what to do with war. That, that's what I... So indeed, as, as, as you justly referred, I'm rather practical in my thinking. It's not uninformed by any kind of research, but I sometimes sought... Yeah sort my moments in time with philosophers in science. And I think youth should be granted philosophy, the room and the space to think and consider, to opinion. There is my point. So it's not for the competences as such, let me be clear for that, because they are obvious and good, but we need to progress. Yeah, but uh, no, I, I, I take that, but Mick, I just uh, ask one little reflection, which is to do with, um, if, if students are left to um, find their own um, skills in respect to things like strategic capacities, transitions, um, a critical approach to the uh, economic paradigm, a systems perspective that is needed, at least in the context of the, of the competences framework that's, that's claimed, um, when your students arrive to maturity and the end of the world uh, as active citizens, um, they're going to find and face that the world is um, still dominated by a, a, an institutional and structure of, 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 a, of a dominant uh, economic paradigm that is hostile to sustainability. Uh, would strategic training and systems thinking, formal training help them, do you think, in uh, translating their learned uh, values uh, through their education uh, and your roots to the education um, in, into actions that will change that framework? Thank you for that. That's a wonderful question to explain the philosophy and practice further. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Esteemed professor. Indeed, I wrote, youth should not be assimilated in the present. Present. And I always warn students for that. And so you're still here, young, you're going out, have friends, do sports, go out in the world, and then, then you meet the machinery. Now, the machinery today is preparing to dissolve you, to eat you, to welcome you, devour you. So instead of teaching them systems thinking, 
I apply systems thinking. And I would like to teach teachers to apply systems thinking and to make youngsters understand that the toy business is run through Canada by Palestine people producing in Bangladesh owned by the Chinese. That's the way systems are combined. And that a lot of Disney toys made from wood are constructed from finished birch wood. Now who owns the finished birch wood? And what does it do to the lakes and the factories and the logistics? And where does Mars come in? And how long can we play with these toys? And have to throw, have to, do we have to throw them away? So after that associative narrative, I said, this is systems thinking. You're scratching on the surface of systems thinking. You will need to understand that everything is connected with everything and not only not linear, no, sometimes totally illogic. Sometimes it is chaos, but study the chaos. Study the uncertainty and insecurity. That's my proposal for systems thing, as it is for social learning, by the way. So I do respect the outcome of a long academic tradition bringing us these insights in sustainable development. But if I may answer that personal, I grew a bit restless. Because when working in these ROCs, this further education system in university and, and lower secondary, there was no energy and understanding to learn. And kids told me, they are yours, I, I don't want, I don't care. Why the toys are made of finished birch wood? How, what could I care? So there I challenged the whole ESD community to stand up and raise their bag and answer these questions. What if we don't care anymore? Let alone make it normative, prescribe values. But there are some in the room that say, why do we need the birch wood? See, because kids can eat it. It doesn't need chemicals to, to, to withhold color. How did you know that? I think because perhaps I'm a system thinker denouncing systems thinking. Thank you. The opposition will be continued by Professor Dr. Anja Krumeich, who was also a member of the assessment committee and a chair is in translational ethnographies in global health at this university. The floor goes to Professor Kumeich. Thank you. Dear candidate, uh, of course, uh, congratulations with your uh, challenging book, challenging in all kinds of ways for me to read it. I really uh, needed to make notes on the way to follow your uh, discussions. And I usually am uh, not below average intelligence. And I think that's, uh, it's a nice way of um, writing. It is unacademic and a little bit challenging. So I really had to uh, make a lot of effort uh, to read it and to really get what you're saying. Um, so having said that, I think I managed. Um, and I think what strikes me most when reading, reading your book is uh, the rebellious nature, uh, which you call practical. And you, uh, you are not so patient with uh, scientists, neither with people in the EDS field or people in the educational field. You even say that uh, some of the theoretical and scientific debates uh, cover up the lack of progress. And, um, and I think that's uh, an interesting position. It is a position that is more and more uh, coming to the fore in many disciplines. And uh, there in many fields and disciplines, this idea that we uh, instead of uh, starting from rigid structures, rigid, uh, rigid models, uh, etc., we should uh, get out of that. And we should be uh, not thinking out of the box, but throw away the boxes, as you yourself uh, mentioned. Um, the problem is there that uh, if you want to do that, you need to somehow also um, be transparent. You need to make people uh, to think along with you, you need to give them the opportunity to criticize you, to understand your choices. And uh, so you propagate actually in methodology, in educational theory, and also in the way uh, you would like to apply the whole EDS uh, uh, field in a dialogical way. Uh, it needs to be done by in dialogue. And you talk about we very often. 
And in your book, you talk, to, you talk about things like the things we truly believe in, in multidisciplinary um, alliances, in an EDS framework, in um, uh, who is, you know, in all these kinds of things. And you seem to suggest that whatever you have been doing is not uh, coming from scientific conventions or framework, but from a dialogue. And I would like to uh, have a bit of a clear review because very often I see you also yourself at work in dialogue where you explain to people why, where they are wrong, the teachers, where they are mistaken. Uh, I was wondering how, uh, who did you invite for this dialogue? Who decided who was going to be invited? How did you organize the dialogue? How was it? How did you make sure everybody's voices were in there? Because that is the, the, the price of a dialogue, the dialogical approach. And I like a bit of transparency there. Was it you or who else was talking? And uh, if yeah. I, well, yeah. <laughs> most distinguished opponent, that is, uh, that is fantastic because that brings me back to the origins of, of this, of this res uh, research and study. I did no more than light a fire. I did never insult. I did never take the TEDx stage and criticize without knowing. I just started questioning out loud. And I addressed the bishop like I addressed the former prime minister, if you allow me. And I addressed professors and said to Mr. Martins, where are we with sustainable development? And what are we doing? I just don't understand. My position was not of claiming knowledge but an expression of not understanding. Then the lady and the man standing next to me said, we know somebody else who has an opinion. Very different from yours. Can, do we have more coffee and more cake? Can we invite them? So we did. So over the years, this dialogue evolved on the local, regional, national, and international level. And of course, I'm going short on research. I fully realize that when rereading my work, I tend to go short on research, but I honestly didn't intend to do so. I was in these meetings at UNESCO. It sounds a bit arrogant, perhaps, saying so. But in 2014, when we, still being with United Nations University, when we concluded the decade of education for sustainable development, honorable opponent, in three hours of reflection by 3,000 scientists, there was not one critical perspective in the review, not one point of action, not one phrase of strategy. So in the course of the years, I didn't just criticize, I kept feeling humble, but I restarted my questioning. That is what I did. And now putting it in a book, black and white paper 2D, it might come across as an offense to research, but on the contrary, all these ESD researchers given six to eight, but all the others contributed to this concept. We worked together, discussed the competences. And even with most esteemed researchers, we, I had a message today before yesterday from Daniela Tilbury. He said, just keep speaking. We don't agree, but keep asking. Somebody has to ask the questions. That honorable opponent is the position I took. No more and absolutely no less. And to the dialogue, yes, I am a man of the Agora. I love the debate. I love the warmth of conflict. And, and as I wrote, have it rest in peace and friendship and progress, not hate each other, criticize me. I hope people watching me and saying, where is this fool on the hill coming from? At me, mail me. That's the invite I'd like to extend to everybody. Yeah, well, dear candidate, I fully agree with you that uh, it is always good to ask, ask critical questions and uh, to start dialogues. I have absolutely no problem with that. It's also uh, the, pos the position that I often myself try to take, uh, being a child of the 70s in which uh, these kind of things uh, were also experimented with. 
but what I am not entirely sure is if you say we dialogue, 3,000 people, uh, we agreed. But I wonder who were those 1,000 people? What did you agree on? Uh, what was the dominant voices there? Uh, etc. How do you get, uh, get, get to your conclusions about what was worth writing down and what was not worth writing down? I have questions about the transparency, not about the questioning itself. If you look at the process, transparency, we can all rest assured that I kept not every phone call, but everything in writing we kept, every exchange we reanalyzed over 10 years. So 140,000 emails are in my laptop, but as my wife can witness, I think, my working hours were somewhere between 60, 70, and sometimes 80. I just worked. I cannot put that more bluntly. I and where, where, what were they about? Uh, what did you do with them? Yeah. Well, um, discussing students' fashion, the example of jeans, I called the Branding Meyer family if I, they would welcome me in a cup of tea, and I inquired how they were producing cotton these days and what the fashion in the next five years would look like. They invited teachers, like A's and L invited us in their factories in Eindhoven. I asked school leaders, can you join me to A's and L? Not about chip technology. These school leaders came back and said, what do you know about chip technology? Nothing, they said. But this room, this clean room, it is more clean than a, a surgeon room. So let's talk to the surgeons. What I did, very esteemed opponent, was continuously connecting people with people. It was not just. I eventually took distance and observed and tried to learn what was happening there. So ASML technology is about clean. So Hago Skolmar came in and said, we have something to teach about bacteria and being clean and what that means in hospitals. So the, I'm sorry if that still sounds too energetic, but it is combining people quest for learning and will for education with each other. You cannot but, do that in a pyramid. No, you can't, but you, no. you, you cannot believe that, that it is possible to just combine people's uh, opinions and come with a true objective uh, view. You organize that, you, you read that, you present that, you choose what kind of topics to bring to the core and which not. Well, I didn't choose the topics because I was never aware, for example, that the clean room with ASML was, it was a highly educative point of interest. Uh, he's here, I just saw, one of the first employees of ASML. We got to know each other through technology that should be more better at schools. So indeed, I realize that many connections, and I hope that the connections I uh, sought to create are copy-pasted, a behavior I hope every teacher will copy and, and learn from my defaults, because this process was far from, far from optimal. But at least it got us way further. And now we have new also researchers at the table and mailing in and saying, wow, it's not perfect, Josh. We understand it's not perfect, but can we join? Can we do this in Sofia? It took people in Sofia between last Thursday morning and Saturday afternoon to create an alliance of people I never met, I never spoke to, I never saw. And they said, the thing we share is this opidical thing. So they call each other and say, do you also have this opidical thing? And somebody in Czechoslovakia said, yes, I do. Shall we cooperate? That is my dream. Sure. I am uh, very uh, impressed by uh, your having a dream, but when you say, uh, and that gets us further, I really wonder what you mean by further? Where is that? Where is that? May I suggest that you pick up this discussion uh, later on? Yes, uh, we will. Because I would we'll also will. like to give uh, Professor Dr. Gerjo Kok, who was the chairman of the assessment uh, committee, and who is a <coughs> professor emeriti of applied psychology, I would also like to give him an opportunity to uh, post questions and have a short discussion with uh, the candidate. So the floor goes to Professor Koch. Thank you, uh, Rector. Um, I'll skip the uh, compliments uh, and get to the question. Um, when I was actually reading your dissertation, I noticed at some point that you didn't write scientific um, articles in scientific journals. And at that time, I thought, well, maybe he didn't have time for that. But when I read the, the preface for your dissertation now, I 
thought that, well, you, you say you never insulted anyone, but your description of academia was close to insulting uh, in my view. Uh, so my question is basically, are you going to write scientific papers in scientific journals so that the rest of the scientific world reads about you? And assuming that your answer might be negative, why not? Um, let me consider this for a few minutes because this concerns my near future and doesn't that didn't discuss that with Denise yet. Um, highly esteemed professor, I, dear opponents to all of you, I, I will. I will learn to write and be more concise and behave, take time and be patient. That's the vow I make. So I will not write if I cannot can cannot guarantee when I what I now just vowed. So now on the table are invitations, for example, by New York University. Can you open a book? Can you write something with 3,000 words? I said, impossible. People that know me, they understand. I never write in three, I didn't even speak in 3,000 words, but I will do my utmost. And why didn't I publish so far? I was surrounded by publishers. I was engulfed by papers. So I think the last thing I should do is write another paper. There was also so many bright research, so many people around me. And who am I? to write, who am I to research, to study? Who am I to deserve to be here today? So I'm not me, Can, can I interrupt for one yeah. second? But actually, this is a, a, a partly a positive uh, answer in that sense. But the, the, the whole idea of science is that you don't keep your knowledge to yourself, but you publish so that your colleagues can actually read it and learn from it. And that brings us further. So I was not too happy about your description of academia. So can you explain to me again what your problem with academia is and, and how would you, for instance, suggest uh, some pr progress in the right direction? First, uh, restate that I have absolutely no problem with academia, but I realize I gave the impression I do have. What I criticized is the academia that remain in a lushy forest, look down on the fields of practice and command changes that they cannot understand. I learned to treasure great academia also before the 50s of previous centuries. My, my concern, not my critics, is that we generate academia who forgot about the academic essence themselves. So I sought refuge and help and reflection in very old writings. I, I started to read Schumacher and, 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 and old education philosophers because I was, I was trying to, 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 grab, to, to get a grip on this value because I knew it's there. So I highly esteemed at academica. I truly mean that. My concern is in the super, superfluous studies that I also encountered, especially in this so crucial world of ESD. When I read an article, dear professor, and it says, I, I did this study with five students in initial teacher training. I think five students. And you give me a tractate of 3000 words and it concerned five students. I call, I, I really call, I say, how can you do that? Where is your opinion based on? So, so my, my, it is a concern. My criticism is based in concern. I, I, I beg for progress and I hope for progress. And perhaps the reason I will start writing and publishing is to contribute a bit of progress by inviting from a positive, constructive viewpoint. And what I noticed previous half years, then I, I stopped writing the, the present work, is that indeed academia, other opponent are approaching and inviting. And that gives hope, that is wonderful. That is perhaps the biggest compliment I could deserve to be invited now to work in this world of academia. And I will do my utmost not to shame anybody now supporting me. Okay, thank you very much. It's, it's, I understand what you're saying. And I agree that there are, um, well, not, not everything in, in academia is correct, of course, but uh, there are a lot of useful things as well. And, and I hope when you continue in this way that you can actually contribute to that. Thank you very much. Thank you.
we've still got uh, say one or two minutes uh, left uh, so i'm inviting uh, professor van der brink once again if he would have a very short uh, question or issue to uh, raise uh, yes, th thank you. Gosh, that's a that's a bonus. Um, I, I can exp I'll ask a very brief question, but it's actually a massive subject, um, which is that the your work showed um, Opedica as the ideal method, or certainly a method that that should work. Um, but I suppose, <laughs> am I being interrupted? That's very, very, thank you very much, uh, Professor von der Brink. Uh, the hour has passed, which means okay. that the defense uh, may end here for the time being, of course, because everyone will continue discussion, um, the work of uh, uh, Jos uh, Oesen, but, but for the time being, and in this context, uh, we will stop this session. Um, Jos Oesen, the time appointed for defending your thesis has passed, and the degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and the quality of your defense. Now I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberations and our return in this room. Thank you. Thank you.
Jos Ulsen, the degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and your defense. And in view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Martens is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. Later on, Professor Van der Bos will do the laudatio. And I invite your supervisor, Professor Martens, to now take the floor. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principle of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? I do. Then, by the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you, Joseph Felix Gerardus Eusen, the degree of doctor and grant you all the rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the other members of the committee and affixed with the official seal of the university. Dirios, <laughs> before addressing you in Dutch, I will say a few words to the English speaking members of the com uh, committee. Um, I would like to thank both of you, also on behalf of Professor Martens, for your willingness to assess Dr. Eusen's work. Especially, we are pleased that you were willing to delve into the question how well the dissertation has satisfactorily met the potential of the OPEDICA project. I have decided with the consent of the chairman to honor you, your family, and all those people who have participated in the project to speak uh, this laudatio in our mother's language, not Limburgs, but Dutch. Um, well, it doet me heel veel genoegen, jou, hier, jonge dokter, uh, te kunnen toespreken, ook namens mijn collega promotor uh, Pim Martens. Ik ben een paar jaar geleden betrokken geraakt bij de begeleiding van je proefschrift. Je had toen al een heel lang traject erop zit, waarin je de deelnemers aan het Opeduca project op bezielde wijze had geïnspireerd. En dat je dat kunt, is vandaag ook wel gebleken. Tegenwoordig kennen we een grote verscheidenheid aan proefschriften. AJO's schrijven meestal een proefschrift direct na een studie. Ik vind dat heel plezierig om te lezen, vooral de voorbeeldige toepassing van onderzoeksmethoden en daardoor precies geformuleerde vraagstellingen te beantwoorden. Echt verrassend is het resultaat meestal niet. Werkzaam op de Open Universiteit heb ik een heel ander soort proefschrift te leren kennen. Op wat latere leeftijd kijken auteurs ervan terug op het project waar zij een groot deel van hun leven aan hebben gewijd. Mooie proefschriften. Allebei. Ik waardeer de manier van aanpak van beide. En het is heel belangrijk te beseffen dat beide hun eigen vraagstelling hebben en hun eigen methode. En dat 
jij met de gereedschapskist van een AIO nooit uh, een, zo'n proefschrift had kunnen schrijven, maar dat een AIO met zijn of haar gereedschapskist nooit een proefschrift had kunnen schrijven zoals jij hebt geschreven. In het geval van al, al die proefschriften waaronder onderzoek, want zo'n levenswerk onderzoekt, um, is er een geleidelijke overgang van de fase waarin je als ontwikkelaar en jij ook wel als prediker, functioneert na de fase waarin de habitus van de onderzoeker centraal komt te staan. En daarom wordt dit soort onderzoek ook wel retrospectief ontwikkelingsonderzoek genoemd. In wezen is het een van de lastigste vormen van onderzoek. Want naarmate je de habitus van onderzoeker meer eigen maakt, ga je ook steeds meer realiseren dat voor de beoordeling van het proefschrift hele andere criteria gelden dan voor het project. En de vraag is dan hoe je met je eigen designers bias moet omgaan. Op dat moment heb ik bij de auteurs van dit soort proefschriften wel eens paniek zien toeslaan. Ik had misschien het voordeel dat ik het Opeluca project amper, amper kende. Alleen uit jouw verhalen die ik wel eens bruto afkapte. Wij begeleiders waren eigenlijk alleen maar geïnteresseerd in de vraag hoe jij met behulp van een proefschrift, dus ook met data, duidelijk kon maken waarom het Opedica project verslaagd is. We hebben je daarvoor danig aan de tand gevoerd. Je moest zo precies mogelijk opschrijven wat de ambities van het project waren. En toen dat was gebeurd, heb je in duizenden aantekeningen, vragenlijsten, gespreksverslagen en ontboezemingen die opgeslagen waren in de kelder van jullie huis, moeten zoeken naar bewijzen voor de realisatie van de door jou verwoorde ambities. Ik vind dat we daar ver mee zijn gekomen. En je was eigenlijk in die fase verrassend kritisch en we hebben van een designer bias niet zoveel kunnen merken. Voor al diegenen die vanaf het eerste uur bij het project betrokken zijn, moet dit ook een mooi moment zijn. Dat geldt voor mensen als Theo Bovens, Tom Goedmakers, Martin Paul, die betrokken waren bij de oprichting van het Regional Center of Excellence, Ryan Meus. Maar het geldt misschien nog wel meer voor al diegenen, leraren, politici, vertegenwoordigers van het bedrijfsleven, wetenschapsbeoefenaren, met wie je samen je visie op onderwijs hebt ontwikkeld en een samenspraak met wie je een nieuwe vorm van onderwijs voor duurzame ontwikkeling hebt laten uitkristalliseren. Tegelijkertijd, en dat waardeer ik zeer, ontwikkelde je een groot gevoel voor, van solidariteit met al die mensen voor de klas. En je deelde hun verontwaardiging tegen het waterhoofd van de educatieve verzorgingsstructuur die het onderwijs soms onderdompelt en overrompelt. Niet zonder eigen belang. Tja, het Opedica project heeft zijn stempel gedrukt op je leven de afgelopen 15 jaar. Dat is Denise en de kinderen, Sander en Daphne, zeker niet ontgaan. De laatste twee hebben zich vandaag gekweten van hun taak als paranymf. Jammer genoeg heeft geen van de opponenten van hun diensten gebruik gemaakt. Ja, dat zullen zij zelf wel blij om zijn. Door hen te vragen een lastige passage uit het werk van Jos voor te lezen en daar vervolgens nog een lastige vraag over te stellen. Aan Jos wel te verstaan, niet aan jullie. Voor de goede orde. De enige keer dat ik dat overigens heb meegemaakt, dat dit gebeurde, er waren de paranemfen twee oudere heren die op dat cruciale moment beide hun leesbureau niet bij zich hadden. Dus ook dat deel van de plechtigheid, dat ging niet door. Hoe dan ook, Denise en Jos hebben, nee, de, jullie, de kinderen van Jos, Denise moet ik zeggen, hebben een groot deel van hun jeugd, basisschool, voortgezet onderwijs en universiteit, doorlopen zonder ooit maar één keer met het op Educa project een aanraking te zijn gekomen, behalve dan met de verhalen van Jos natuurlijk. Ze zijn des ondanks goed terechtgekomen. <lacht> Jos heeft tenslotte honderden foto's van kinderen uit verschillende leeftijdsgroepen en uit een reeks van landen waarin het project is uitgevoerd, 
verzameld. En een aantal daarvan is terecht in het proefschrift opgenomen. Het enthousiasme van die kinderen is overduidelijk. Jos, je hebt kunnen aantonen dat dit enthousiasme niet alleen kwam omdat de leerlingen de deelname aan het project leuk vonden, maar vooral omdat ze het gevoel hadden een hoop te leren op een manier waarvan ze nooit gedacht hadden dat dat ook leren was. Jos en alle betrokkenen bij het Educa-project, bedankt. Dear Dr. Peussen, also on behalf of the Board of Deans, I congratulate you and your family and your supervisors with the honor you have acquired. And I would like to thank the members of the uh, degree committee for their uh, opposition as it took place. Um, before closing uh, the session, we're taking some pictures and then we will, of course, Give the other members of the degree committee, I always hesitate whether I have to look there, look here, or look there, but we'll give them an opportunity to congratulate you um, also. I would like to invite and suggest uh, to the audience that you can walk already to the rafter where they will take care of you with a drink and with a, with a seat because you're not allowed to uh, stand around, but you're supposed to take a seat in the rafter and you'll find the rafter by walking out take to your left and then to your right. And um, and Jos will then most probably a few minutes later with his degree um, also show up in the rafter where you, of course, would like to congratulate uh, him. Uh, so hereby I close this session. And uh, enjoy the day.